Hey guys, David from The Modern Martial Artist here. I wanted to talk about Broner versus Vargas a little bit, talk about their styles, and then how they'll kind of match up to each other. Um, fair warning, I got back from training, it was really hard, and uh, I am a little tired, I'm a little out of it, so sorry if I'm low energy or if I stumble or repeat myself a little bit. Um, moving right into it. So, Broner kind of reminds me, he's like, he's like if you were playing Floyd Mayweather in a video game, but you hadn't really worked out the controls yet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you were just kind of meshing buttons. And I know that's mean, but I don't really like Broner. And I've n I have don't think I've ever said that about um, any fighter on this channel before. And it's not because of his trash talking, um, even though it is a level beyond most other fighters' trash talking, and it is really shitty. I usually love trash talking, and I love in-ring antics, and uh, I love clowning in the ring. I love all that stuff. The the humping your opponent thing, I think more humiliates you than it humiliates your opponent. And it's uh it's just it's the a level of disrespect. It's it's like insulting, you know, your opponent's wife or kids or dad or mom or something. It's just like there you know, there there's good fun and, and there and there's shit talking and that's great. There's like clowning around in the in the ring and then there's just being a douche. So I'm still he's still a good fighter obviously or he wouldn't have gone to where he was going to get to. I'm sorry if you're a fan of his. I don't hate you. It's you can be a fan of his all you want. I just don't like him, so I'm just going to be a little bit mean talking about him or meaner than I normally am. Uh so it it's you know, it's no uh secret that he idolizes Floyd Mayweather and he tries to kind of copy his style a little bit. And uh, I saw this great video I can't remember who it was. I think it was an old boxer who was like saying that Broner doesn't really understand fully the concept of uh, the way Floyd uses the Philly shell. And he pointed out that when an opponent throws an overhand um, and you're in the Philly shell, you want to duck, you want to duck away from it and kind of twist your body a little bit. Um, or it doesn't work because there's an opening there. And he was saying that it's a reactive guard. And then so just watching Broner, I'm just uh, looking through all of it, and it's like, yeah, everything he does, it's just, there's just one tiny thing missing from the way he does it. And it really made me respect Floyd Mayweather even more than I already uh, respect his, his fighting abilities, because it's just these tiny little intricacies, and I could see why his opponents get so frustrated, Mayweather's, um, and, and get so desperate in the ring, because it's got to be really annoying not knowing exactly what's going on. So besides his vulnerability to the overhand right, um, there are just a bunch of tiny little nu nuances that he does different than Floyd that results in him not being as effective, even though he is very effective. Before we get into those, I want to say that he does reap the, some of the benefits of the Philly shell, and he uses those very well. And, and these are mainly just straight-on offensive benefits. Um, one of them is that because of the more sideways stance, um, and the way that the, your right hand rests right on your body, as opposed to anywhere outside, it, it's lined up directly on the center line. So it's really great to angle in an uppercut. He's he's landed some amazing uppercuts before uh, Brunner has, and uh, and and just like these really tight um, these really tight crosses, where that that are just kind of short. And he's best in close when he's doing these things because that kind of just takes all the rest of the intricacy out of it and you just let the the guard kind of do its work um so he's good at that that being said I, i'm just going to go over a couple things um that i noticed he does differently from floyd and the first one is huge and it's distance management so floyd keeps himself at the perfect when he when he wants to when he's jabbing with his opponent, we'll say, when, when they're at, at jabbing range, he keeps himself just far enough away to where his opponent has to reach. And uh, the, the Philly shell is a reactive guard in the way that it's meant to draw punches so you could counter off of it. That's its purpose. And it leaves one very specific opening, always. And the point of that is that you know that you're entirely safe if your opponent punches anywhere else but you have that vulnerability, and now that you know the one vulnerability that you have, you can work off of it. And uh, so you know that the only thing that needs to bother me is if my opponent throws a punch to that spot. And if he does throw a punch to that sh uh, to that spot, I have a counter in my head that I'm going to use, um, or several different counters that I'm going to use. And so 
at um at kind of jabbing range, Mayweather, first of all, he stands entirely sideways. Entirely sideways. Uh Broner leaves himself just slightly too open when he does it, and so it's possible for an opponent to kind of step around him. But if you're talking at exact jabbing range, then the only thing that should be open in the Philly shell is really just the this one kind of spot um like around your chin, not the side of your chin, because your shoulder should be propped up, which um is another thing Broner doesn't do entirely too well is he doesn't prop his shoulder up and he leaves his chin open as well i'm going <laughs> i'm trying to keep this a, st a step at a time but it, there's just so many tiny little differences I'm, I'm noticing so he's not entirely if you imagine he's not entirely sideways so he's already more open than floyd and then his shoulder isn't propped up quite as high so that's opening even more and then his chin isn't turned to where it's being covered by the shoulder his chin is kind of at an angle it's not entirely facing his opponent so with floyd half of his shoulder is on his chin and then uh and then all he has to worry and then his hand uh his rear arm is protecting elbow on the ribs and then the boxing glove is protecting kind of the rest of the chin and his head's just kind of tucked down low uh with broner it's it's like uh he's 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 so much more open than that. And uh, when his opponent jabs at him, Floyd does this thing where his opponent jabs and Floyd steps back slightly, which conditions his opponent to overreach. And he leans back, which conditions his opponent to overreach even more. And when it, when you overreach, you're widening your stance. So your jab's going to get lower and lower and lower as you overreach more and more and more because you're, it's like you're sinking down off that wider stance as you reach and reach and reach. So Floyd ends up just um, pairing uh, his opponent's punches at chest level, even though they started off with the intention of throwing, uh, throwing it at head level. And uh, Broner tries to do the same thing, except he's doing it moving forward or just staying in the same place. And he'll parry, for some reason, expecting the punch to be at chest level, even though he's not leaning back or stepping back, and I'll just punch him in the face like he didn't even see the punch. It's very strange. It's like he's expecting the stance to have some kind of magical powers that redirect the, his opponent's punch. Um, and so that's one thing, is distance management and the, the way he kind of uh, stands there. Um, another big thing is he'll, he'll switch to hard, high guard like Floyd does, but when Floyd's doing this, he kind of squares up more to, t to take advantage more of... Um, of high guard and then he'll load his weight onto his lead leg and his opponent will punch and Floyd will either having he'll either have all this space well you know in between his feet because he's so far forward he'll have all this space to quickly lean back open his guard and counter or he'll be able to kind of um, just absorb a few punches as he moves forward and tries to pressure an opponent which you see less and less nowadays but you saw saw him do that with uh, McGregor so Broner just kind of leaves his guard, in contrast, he leaves his guard open and kind of balanced, and it seems like it's just there for him to take punches when he tries to j just crowd his opponent and then try to try to really get at them, um, you know, just kind of pressure them. So, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's just all the, the minor differences I noticed. He's, his distance management, his upper body movement, he doesn't, like Floyd will straight up turn and knock a punch away with his elbow. Um, he'll, he'll turn like past the center line to the, to the inside, uh, propping up his shoulder. Whereas Broner just stays open. He doesn't prop his shoulder. He doesn't rest his chin on his, uh, on his, um, shoulder. And, uh, and, and his right hand seems like I said, is like he's randomly pushing buttons. He doesn't pay attention to what punch is coming at him. He pays attention to what punch he thinks should come at him, which is really strange. Um, also, when Floyd, um, it's it, like it's a very in and out style, right? So when Floyd gets put into a position that he doesn't want to be in, when his opponent steps in and opens him up, because Philly Shell, if your opponent gets to the inside and and, and Philly Shell, like imagine instead of standing sideways, you're standing straight in an opponent in a Philly Shell. It's a terrible guard to have it in that case, right? So if an opponent gets a good angle on Floyd's inside is basically that position. It's like you're standing straight forward, squared up at someone in a Philly shell. So Floyd will immediately duck very, very low and pivot out. Um, and uh, I, I've covered that a little bit before in, in my breakdown of him. And uh, man, it, it does, does Broner not know how to do that? <laughs> so, you know, he'll get caught in these open positions and just, just stay in that same in that same uh, in the same Philly shell, which is really bad for an open position, or he'll just uh, charge in an opponent in an open position in a Philly shell, and it, it doesn't work. Um, it does. It, it just doesn't work. Um, 
That being said, he has a he has a good chin. He's very good close up, um, landing these tight shots. He he can put some power into his shots, and he's you know he's a good fighter. It's just uh, and and maybe I'm being overly harsh. It's just like it's like seeing it's it's like Mayweather is good at like uh. I don't know. I've never been very much into into sword fighting or anything. But he's got like it's like he's got like one of those fencer blades, right? Mayweather's like a fencer, and he's got that tiny little blade, and and these big dudes will walk up to him with like a huge axe, and Floyd will just kind of like counter it and the, the and then step in, and it's all very subtle and nuanced. And I feel like Broner's trying to use that same tiny blade that requires all this nuance, but he just grabs it with two hands and just starts like hacking. At someone and it you know it works somewhat because it yeah it is a sword it, it will cut people but it's it's just not he's not using it kind of to, to the capacity that is you know that it, it it made me realize that Floyd isn't just I mean I already knew but it made me realize more so how Floyd isn't just a all about style the stuff it he requires like he has incredible, insane reflexes, just absolutely insane reflexes um, that I just think Brunner doesn't. And I think you need those reflexes to have the kind of style that Floyd Mayweather has. You know, just like the majority of people can't do Muhammad Ali style because they get knocked out in a second. I, I feel it's kind of it's not as much that with Floyd as it, it is with Ali, but it's um, you know, it is a reactive style in so much as it looks protective. It always has that one opening, and if you don't know how to use that opening to kind of bait your opponent, then uh, then it's not going to work 100% of the time. So I have much less to say about uh, Vargas because um, he he has a much more simple style. But you know that being said, it is very effective, and he's a very very good boxer, obviously. Um, and I'm not shitting on his style by saying it's simple; it just is more simple. So he's got kind of like a loose high guard and. Uh, Great at slipping, doesn't need to slip because he's also good at just blocking or catching his punch with either hand. Um, he can stand sideways and, and circle and jab, but um, from what I've seen, he has like a bit more square of a stance. What that allows you to do is step in deep and maintain your balance and move your head from side to side. So if you have a sideways kind of narrow bladed stance, that then you have a lot of upper body motion backwards or forwards. Uh, if you have like a wider stance, you're going to be able to think Tyson... Um, more squared up, a little bit wider, you're going to be able to move your upper body side to side. And so Vargas is really good at stepping in deep, throwing uh, throwing his right, circling out of it, and then going like right into another punch because he's so well balanced. So um, also good jab, um, good footwork. That's that's really all I have to say about him. I spent a lot because it's like it's such a it's such it's such a simpler style. Um, it really is, uh, but you know, so so is so is peekaboo style. It's when you, if you're not Mike Tyson, if you're just going by like you know very basics of it, that's a simple style too. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's simple, and simple can a lot of times be effective. Um, Vargas does kind of crouch low and keep his chin up, and you'd think that would make him susceptible to uppercuts, but a, a lot of people just don't realize that uppercuts, it, like slipping, works with uppercuts too to the head. Um, and if you're already leaning down and your, your head's kind of far away from your feet, then you don't need to worry near as much as getting hit with an, with an uppercut or a body hook to the body because it's farther away. So you have to kind of time to see it coming. So, uh, and you know, some fighters are bad at that, but you can definitely slip an uppercut moving side to side. And if that doesn't work, you, you know, just, you always have your hand. Um, so that, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Now let's look at where kind of where I, I see the vulnerabilities for either fighter. Um, so I mentioned this before, and this isn't me pointing this out. Like I said, I saw a video on, on uh, I can't, I wish, really wish I could remember who it was, but I saw the video a while ago. Um, Vargas has a really good cross and a really good overhand. Um, anything with his right, he's able to step in very deep. And the, the problem, there's two problems um, for Broner with this. The first one is, like I said, Floyd was obsessed um, at least at the beginning of his fights, before he'd kind of worn down and, and demoralized and gotten the feel for his opponents, at staying completely sideways. And and so if an opponent got a, an inside angle on him that kind of squared him up when he didn't want to be squared up, he was very good at pivoting out of it and, and remaining defensive or just um, uh, clinching. 
Whereas Broner will absolutely let that happen, happen and, uh, and try to fight from there. And that's gotten him hit a lot of times. And uh, Vargas is very good at stepping in deep um, and, and kind of forcing that squared up angle. And so another big problem that's, that's kind of in conjunction with that is his right. So I think that, uh, and the way that, um, as the guy pointed out, uh, Broner doesn't really, um, I don't think he mentioned he didn't pop his shoulder. I think that was, or, or, or touch his chin to his shoulder. I think that was more me just watching it. I don't think he mentioned that, but Broner definitely doesn't roll with it. Um, he'll just do that sideways turn. He doesn't really roll with the overhand right. So I think that's a major problem for him and, and the fact that he squares himself up. Um, and I think that'll be a problem in this fight, especially if Vargas could establish his jab. Um, where Vargas will get in trouble, I know I just said that um, Vargas, you know, Vargas shouldn't worry too much about, doesn't need to worry too much about uppercuts with his style because he's good at slipping them, stepping off line, and, and maintaining distance. But one thing that Brunner's very, very good at is uh, is fighting up close in the Philly shell. So, uh, and I don't know why that is, but but he just he really is. He he has he can. And I've seen him counter with that tight uppercut too. So he's he's just very good. Shoulder to shoulder is, I feel, where Vargas needs to worry. Because shoulder to shoulder, it will kind of force Vargas upright, potentially. Um, and uh, Or a little bit more upright than he's used to. He's crowded in there. And he might not be able to see that uppercut coming straight down the center line or that cross coming straight down the center line. Uh, so I think that's that's kind of where he needs to worry a little bit. And that's pretty much all I have to say about this fight. Um, I never, ever do this, but I really hope Vargas wins. <laughs> and there's been fighters, I feel like, who've been so much worse. I don't know what pisses me off about Broner so much. And uh, I know it's unprofessional. Um, I mean, but, you know, whatever. These podcasts are a little looser than the, than the technique breakdowns. And so I need to, every once in a while, I need to have some fun, you know. But I think it's going to be a great fight. I think it's... Um, probably going to be entertaining. I could also see it being really, really boring as hell. So I hope it doesn't turn out that way. I hope it ends up really entertaining. Uh, but I, it, I'm like 80% sure it's going to be good. It's going to be really, and I think I would advise tuning in. Um, I'm more interested in, I need to check the times, obviously. Um, I'm going to try to go to, a, to go to a bar that has both playing at the same time, if they're both at the same time, which they most likely are. But the uh, Lee versus Barboza fight is tomorrow too, I believe. And so... I need to find a place that's kind of showing both of these, but I definitely, um, I mean, if you're a boxing fan or an MMA fan, then the choice is obvious. If you're both like I am, then uh, I'd recommend uh, the Lee versus Barboza fight more than I would this one. Um, but that's just personal preference. So yeah, hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, feel free to leave any questions, comments, people you'd like to see broken down, techniques you'd like to see drills or, or demonstrations for. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming out for you um, this week. I'm going to work on The War, which all back boxing fans will know what The War is. Um, I'm going to finally break that down. Uh, and then I'm going to have some Wonder Boy Thompson demonstrations and drills, um, especially since the video is not, not up anymore uh, except on Patreon. So, yeah, that's it for this very late night uh, breakdown. Sorry, I didn't get it out sooner. All right, that's it. Happy training.